You know, as a Sony shooter, I gotta say, I'm pretty jealous of the Canon R5 specs. So today I made a slideshow for you guys and we're gonna discuss how Sony can compete with Canon. So you know what? Let's just get into that right now, okay? Okay, looking at this spec sheet, you know, we got the new image sensor and processor. Then we got the different frame rates you can shoot in, both mechanical and silent. Then we got the 8K RAW, which we're going to talk about at the end, because that's a little divisive for me. I'm not 100% sure how I feel about it. Then we got the in-body stabilization, which is very important we're going to talk about. Dual pixel autofocus, both systems have pretty good autofocus, so I'm not going to be too keen on the autofocus that much. Dual card slots, both cameras have dual card slots, but Sony uses SD cards while Canon's starting to introduce CF Express cards, which Sony might have to do if we're going to be shooting raw video with the upcoming cameras, but we're going to get into more of that in the future. And then the free image Canon cloud service, which I think Sony should also include, just so that we can back up our pictures and not lose them. When it comes to photography, I feel like most cameras nowadays do a good enough job. You can get something like a Panasonic G7, and this is what I use for a long time, and you can still do professional work with this camera. It's just a 60 megapixel camera, but in my opinion, you only need around 20 megapixels to like get like a decent image nowadays, but this is 60 megapixels, and it's still perfectly fine. Nowadays, I mainly just shoot the Sony a7R 3 which is a 42 megapixel camera, but the thing is that you only really need that extra 20 megapixels more for cropping. Like with the A7R 3 whenever I'm shooting with a model, what I like to do is just shoot a little bit wider. And then later in post-processing, then I can just, you know, crop my image and then frame it however I want. So it's good for that. But the thing to keep in mind with these high megapixel cameras is that you do have to do extra processing at the end because you know if you're shooting with especially a female model you know you're gonna have to smooth out their face a little bit or else you know it, there's just too much detail with it and people just don't look that good in higher megapixels both in photo and video that's why when it comes to photo i'll deal with like shooting with like a 40 megapixel camera because it's not that big of a deal to you know just smooth out someone's face a little bit and fix the blemishes but when it comes to video that's why I like shooting 1080p over 4K because it's a pain in the ass to like fix someone's face in video. You know, you would have to spend like hundreds of hours doing CGI while in photo you just, you know, click around a little bit. One thing that is amazing when it comes to photography is the higher frame rates you can get with it and the IBIS. Because the higher frame rate, you know, with the A7R 3 it does around 8 frames per second. And for me, that's more than fine. You know, I don't do like high speed sports, but for wildlife, I like to shoot wildlife. You know, it does come in handy, but for me, 8 frames is more than enough. But with the Canon R5, you can do 12 mechanically and a 20 frames per second electronically. And the electronic part is going to depend on how the rolling shutter is. If it's bad, then that 20 frames is going to be completely useless because you're only going to be using it when there's like a high speed situation if you're doing shooting sports or wildlife. So if there's a lot of just, you know, warping and stuff, you know, those shots are going to be ruined. But the 12 mechanically is amazing and it almost cannibalizes the 1DX Mark III that just came out, which does 16 mechanically and 20 also. So if it can do 20 electronically without any problems, then it's like, why would you buy a 1DX Mark III at that point, you know? So, I mean, there's other reasons because of its build quality and everything, but still, it, this the thing about this camera, it kind of just cannibalizes it's other cameras that Canon put up, like their um, C300 that they've just put up. And that camera does only 6K, while this camera does 8K. So it's interesting what they're doing with this camera. I don't think it will do as well as what the specialized cameras are doing. You know, the video camera is always going to have better video quality than the DSLR they're putting out. But it does 8K, while the other ones can't do 8K. So we'll see how it is. So when it comes to the next Sony camera, hopefully they'll tr at least match up with it, you know, because with the a7 IIIs it, can it only does 10 frames per second mechanical and 20 electronically. So technically, this Canon R5 is better than Sony's sports camera, but we'll see. And if Sony ends up putting global shutter onto their next camera, I mean, that would be just amazing, both for video and also for shooting sports. Next thing we're going to talk about is the stabilization and the Canon R5 does 8 stops of IBIS with an image stabilizer lens which is so amazing. And if we get to the Sony's they're 
all terrible. I just put dog shit because honestly, the stabilization on these cameras are pretty much non-existent. Like, it, I mean, there is a difference between having the stabilization on and off. But honestly, with the Sony FS5 that I'm shooting with right now, I get better stabilization, even though it doesn't have any IBIS, just because it has a better form factor, so it's you can shoot better with it. So that's one thing that I would hope that Sony actually implements in their next cameras, is that put like a proper IBIS in these cameras so that we don't have to use gimbals. I mean, that that's my caveat, you know, I hate gimbals. So I would love it if Sony were to just, you know, put like the most, you know, you know, freaking just buy at Olympus. Buy at Olympus, just get their IBIS, some of their lenses, and then, you know, do whatever else you want with them. But honestly, that's what these cameras need because the IBIS is just completely useless on these cameras. And we can get like around like eight, eight stops of IBIS in these cameras. It would be amazing both for videos and photography because... When it comes to photography, if you have real good IBIS, you can do like long exposure, you know, just handheld. And with these cameras, you definitely cannot do that. So <clears throat> that's one thing I hope they implement for photographers. All right, now when it comes to videography, you know, this is where, um, you know, this is where some things are kind of mixed with me. Cause, um, so let's get to a better IBIS. I already just talked about it. Hopefully they put better IBIS so that, you know, we don't have to use gimbals, you know. I don't like using gimbals there's always some problem with them you know it's first of all it's they're always a pain in the ass to set up you know because you have to like for some reason they haven't been able to like figure out a way where you can just put the camera on it and it just like measures the weight of the, the camera and then just like sets it up automatically even if you get like the super expensive ones you still can't do that you have to like manually do micro adjustments if you put like a landscape on it like miss the whole thing it's it's just ridiculous but once you do get it working it is pretty amazing so the things that i'm saying better ibis or maybe even gyro sta gyro based stabilization which is they implemented it in the Sony FS9, which works amazingly. And what it does is they pretty much just puts they they put a gyro inside the camera and it saves the data of the gyro. So when you use that in the video, you actually don't see anything. But later in post, you can stabilize the footage using that gyro information, which and which works out really well. So I would actually prefer that over IBIS, because with IBIS there can be like some problems. You know, if you're doing tilting or something. So it would be cool to have the option to, like, do proper stabilization later in post. Okay, this is another big one. You know, for professionals, I think this is a must, which is the no record limit. Which, you know, with the Canon R5, you know, there's a lot of limits to what you can do. You know, people are kind of reporting that, you know, this video is being made before the camera is released in, like, three weeks. But so far, the only bad thing I'm hearing is that there's some overheating issues, which can be detrimental. Because if you're shooting something important, like if you're shooting like an interview for a corporation, that can, you know, that can go on for like an hour. So if you don't have a camera that can shoot for an hour, guess what? Your camera is completely useless. So we know that Ken R5 can't shoot on limit, has a 30 minute shooting limit. And that's pretty much a deal breaker for me for a video camera because the same thing happened with the Sony a7R 3 This camera cannot shoot th more than 30 minutes. Why? Some people say it's because of like some taxing issues. I don't think that's it. I think it's some more of an overheating issue besides fixing that. They're just like, oh, just make sure so that they can only shoot 30 minutes. It's ridiculous. And especially since a camera like this Panasonic G7, this can shoot for an hour. I mean, no, it can shoot unlimited. As long as you want it, as long as it doesn't overheat, I guess. But I never had this camera overheat while I'm shooting with it. And that, that can only be done in 1080p mode, which, which honestly, if this camera can do it, then the Sony a7R 3 should be able to do it also. So hopefully in their next cameras, they will add the unlimited recording. That's one thing that will be huge in my opinion, especially for professionals, because... You know what, if you get a gig that's, you know, like shooting a conference or, again, interviews, those are going to go for more than 30 minutes. So if you don't have a camera that can do that, then, you know, you're not going to be able to get those jobs. That's one of the reasons why I bought the FS5, because I was getting these jobs that I, where I had to, like, shoot for a long time, but I couldn't do with the Sony a7 cameras. So I got the Sony FS5 for pretty cheap, around, like, $2,000, and it can shoot amazing 1080p for as long as I want. And I believe you can even like hot swap the SD cards 
or record externally and just you can pretty much shoot forever with this camera. So that's one thing I hope they implement with the next generation of cameras that will for professionals because only really professionals are going to buy these cameras or like doctors, you know. So I hope they put the no recording limit on it. At least if, even in like 1080p. That will be perfectly fine with me. If they're like, you know, if we want to do 4K or 6K, that's going to cause the camera to read. I'm like, that's fine. Just give us, you know, unlimited recording for, you know, just 1080p. That's perfectly fine. Full HDMI port. I think this is a big one. For some reason on the Canon, they put a... I think it's either mini or micro HDMI, but either way, we need full HDMI ports. I don't know why they put these micro mini. I know they do it to save space, but either way, like even on this camera, on the Sony A7R 3 they put a micro HDMI port and I, I had, I think like, I rarely use it. And even though I rarely use it, I work two HDMI cords on here because they're just so finicky. They break easily and it's just pointless. Just put a full HDMI port in there, you know? I don't care if the camera has to be bigger. At least we can have like a port that we can properly use. And we don't have to go out and buy like, you know, extra HDMI cables. Now this is a big one for Sony A7 cameras that I don't see enough people complaining about, which is that when this camera is, for some reason, I don't know what the big problem is with these cameras, is that the moment you take the lens off of them, like the shutter, the shutter is exposed. So it just immediately grabs every like dust in the air. This is the only camera that I had this like problem with. Like when I shot with other cameras, I never even like cleaned the shutter off of them because I never just had like dust just like be sucked inside of them. But for some reason with this camera, it just sucks in so much dust that like, even if you're like really careful, you take it off for a second and you put it back on, you get like dust in it immediately. So with the Canon cameras, they're just closing the shutter when you take it off. So I hope Sony implements something similar to it because this is a big problem. Because if you're shooting somewhere and then while you're shooting in the middle of it, you just like catch like sw swap from an 85 1.8 to like a 35 1.4. Then guess what? You just get a sensor on your dust and then all the next thousand pictures you're taking are just have dust spots on them. Or if you're shooting video, there's a dust spot on it. And then, you know, it's just a huge pain in the ass. And I don't know why Sony hasn't fixed that or um, at least put a closed shutter so that it's it'll also like save the, sh the sensor's life if you end up like dropping it or something. And now this is the flip out screen. So with the Sony A7 cameras, you know, they have this. This is just like the flip up screen, which to be honest for photography, I love this. I think this is superior to the, <clears throat> the just the flip out screen that you get with this because you can just easily like flip it out and you know it's just more flexible while you're working with it the only thing i will say is that if you're shooting from low and you want to do it vertically you can't lift it up like this that that would be one big thing that i would want but if we're gonna make this a video centric camera then i think we're gonna need the flip out screen that's huge. But if this is going to be a hybrid camera, then I would recommend something like the S1H where it's kind of like best of both worlds. It'll like flip up and it can also like take out and you can also see yourself at the front. That would be huge. Because for shooting video, you know, sometimes you have to be in front of the camera for shooting videos like this. But you also be, have to be in front of the camera because, you know, you're coaching the client that you're shooting with or, you know, you just want to check your frame. You know, it, it's just better to just have a camera that can have a rotating thing like the Sony Fest 5 right here. And now here comes the big question. Do we need 8K? Now, personally, you know, I like shooting 1080p. I'm a 1080p guy. I don't even like shooting 4K unless if I know I'm going to be doing some cropping or anything. Because people just look better in 1080p. Once you go past 1080p, you start getting unnecessary detail, I like to call. You know, if you're shooting with pretty much any human, you know, people have pores, they have pimples in their face, and things that look. If you compare 1080p footage and 4K footage, like, side by side, you know, the extra detail tricks your mind thinking until it looks better. But then look at the people. You know, you start seeing, you know, their acne, and I'm just talking about 4K. So, you know, it's like whenever I see, like, some comparison video of, like, the new cameras where, like, people build these, like, amazing sets and, you know, they interview people and they show the videos in, like, 8K or 6K. It's like, yeah, it's sharp, but, like, I'm also, like, seeing, like, the acne that's on, like, the guy's corner of his mouth and, that, and that's distracting to me. I don't know. I personally don't like shooting more than 1080p. 
I think besides focusing on um you know just high resolution, which in my opinion resolution should be a creative choice. It shouldn't be that oh higher resolution is better because it's it's truly not. That's why people love the look of film, not because it's like so sharp, but because it it is a softer image. So it's pleasing to the eye. And another thing about film is that it's the dynamic range that like gives it a good look. So I think besides focusing on resolution, they should be focusing more on dynamic range and trying to get it more close to film, more like human eye, and that will make the image look a lot better than you know having it be high resolution. So personally, I don't care about 8K, you know, but things that they might need to put 8K just to compete with Canon. But personally. I would be fine with just 4K, honestly. But and another thing is that, to keep in mind, is that to get 8K, you need at least 32, 33 megapixels. While 6K is around 90 megapixels. So if the next camera they're making is a Sony a7S III, which previously was, I think, a 12 megapixel camera, you know, it won't be able to do 6K or 8K. But if they were to up the megapixels to like around 20, it could do 6K then. And I think that's what they will do. I doubt they will go to like 33 megapixels because then they'll be cannibalizing their A7 line. So I think the next camera, the A7S III, will be 20 megapixels with 6K. I think, I think that'll be a good reasonable amount. And another thing, let's get good 1080p in there. The Sony A7R 3 has horrible 1080p. If you look at the shadows in the Sony A7 III, you know, you got, you know, purple fringing. It just looks terrible. But with the Sony A7FS 5 even though both of these cameras do 50 megabits per second in 1080p, so they're very compressed, but the Sony A7 looks terrible, while the Sony FS5 looks amazing. I don't know what the difference is. I guess the codec or the sensor or just, you just get cleaner footage out of the FS5. So I'll say get good 1080p in there. I think that's gonna be a big deal besides, you know, cause that's what most professionals shoot at. Most people shoot in 1080p. Maybe they'll shoot in 4K, but I'll say get good 1080p in there. And let's really focus on the 1080p. So let's do like 1080p, 10-bit, maybe even 12-bit. There's no like real camera out there. Unless if you buy like an Aerie that can do like 1080p, 12-bit. That will be amazing. Another thing is that let's get those high frame rates again, you know. With the Sony FS5, they went crazy. They gave us, you know, 120 frames per second in 1080p. They gave us 240 frames per second in 1080p. They gave us 480 frames per second and 960 frames per second in 1080p. Now, once you go past 480, it kind of starts looking terrible. But things that they still gave us those options. So I would like to see those frame rate options come back in their next camera. I think that will be huge. And again, for 4K, give us like 4K 60, maybe 120. You know, again, I don't really shoot 4K, but I know a lot of people do. So just to please those people, give us like 4K 120, and I think that'll be amazing. But again, give us some good 1080p, and that would be amazing. And also internal RAW. Now this is an issue that I've been having with Sony cameras forever because for some reason Sony just refuses to do internal RAW. Like they refuse to do any sort of RAW on their um. DSLR type mirrorless cameras, which is fine. It's a it's supposed to be a photography camera, but whatever. But in their cinema line, you know, with the Sony FS5, if you want to do internal RAW, you can't do it. You have to do external RAW. If you get the Sony FS7, you have to do external RAW. If you get the ten thousand dollar FS9, you still have to do external RAW. If you get the seventy thousand dollar Sony Venice. That is a cinema camera. You still have to buy like an extra extension and do external raw. Like I, I don't understand it. You know, again, I'm probably not gonna shoot raw, but I would like to see the option for it. And even if they don't give us internal raw, I would love to see if they had like ProRes or ProRes raw. That would be just amazing. Knowing that Sony, they probably won't do internal raw, but at least it would be nice if they gave us option to do external raw with the A7S III and give us a full HDMI so we can you know, just plug it into an Atomos and then just get like ProRes from that. So I would be fine with that. But I think that's gonna be it guys. So All right, let's, you know, that's go gonna to be video. it guys. Again, this video was made before the R5 came out, you know, three weeks before it. So we'll see how the R5 will 
turn out once it actually comes out. But anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you guys think about the R5 and what Sony needs to do to compete with it. Personally, like, with the A7R 3 and the FS5, I pretty much have everything I want, honestly. So, I'm good, and I don't... I don't have any like much many Canon lenses anyway, so I can't really switch over. But, but that's the camera I would love to play around with because it does seem like the best camera that's coming out right now, and it's very exciting. And and it's good to have cameras like this coming out from other companies also because it will push the competition. It will push Sony to do better because right now Sony kind of just has been like way ahead of everyone. So we're gonna see how it turns out. But anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed this video. I make videos every single week, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.